Hello, welcome to the Royal Meteorological Society summer um, virtual conference. Sorry about being muted. Um, yeah, so welcome to the final session of the day. So this is nine, uh, science communication. So it's chaired by myself, Sean and Hannah. Uh, and we have three great speakers for today. They'll each give a short talk and then we're followed by a Q&A like we did yesterday. So our first speaker today is Claire Nazir. So. Hi there, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I'm going to try and speak for seven minutes. I normally dry up after two because I am a weather broadcaster as well as meteorologist. Uh, so please bear with me. I've got a lot of slides to get through. Now, today, the Hadley Centre has released its latest paper. The Hadley Centre is part of the Met Office. Um, it's embargoed to 4 p.m. PM. I'll be talking about it later. And it's going to be published in Nature Communications. And the top line, the chances of 40 Celsius days in the UK uh, increasing due to human influence. And this was prompted by a last year's record breaking temperature in Cambridge, 38.7 degrees Celsius. The paper makes for very interesting reading. It's really relevant, actually. And obviously, since last week, we did have a heat wave it's still in people's minds. Climate change is going to be a hot topic for decades, if not millennia to come. It's all changing. We've got a new normal. Um, and there's fresh evidence which now reinforces the issue in a way which is really clear and relevant. Now, the interesting thing about uh, this, this report is its methodology is based on attribution studies, and that's comparing extreme weather events through model simulation with and without human influence on climate. So let's rewind to 2018. And for me, this was a really pivotal year in the way that I messaged weather, and particularly the, the, the communication of weather and climate change. Prior to that, whenever we had a heat wave or any extreme weather, I he would be asked, and, and all of us get asked, is this down to climate change? And there was a standard and disappointing answer. And that is, it's impossible to put one single event down to climate change. But that all changed during the summer of 2018. And that was thanks to um, attribution studies. Now, when we do get a heat wave, the, the press go absolutely mad. They really do. They, they lap it up. And certainly sort of the Mediterranean climate coming north to the UK, staycation ticket to stay home and, and enjoy the sunshine. But there's a real delicate balance between talking about heat waves and what is beyond that thin veil of heat and sunshine. The heat wave of 2003 cost uh, Europe 70,000 extra deaths. Um, but this information tends to come much later, months if not years. But when you're knee deep in heat, everybody wants to know why is it so hot? So the summer of 2018 um, was a really fascinating meteorological um, scenario. The northward shift of the jet stream produced anticyclonic conditions, which was easy to communicate. But the synoptic situation was very different to what we'd seen before with the summer of 76, uh, 95, 2003, all which were joint hottest years on record. We didn't have that air mass coming in from the south or southeast. It was slightly different. Yes, coastal waters were suffering their own heat wave and moisture, more soil moisture content was very, very low. It had been extremely dry. But these factors alone were not sufficient to fully explain the, the temperature anomaly that we've been seeing. Cue the attribution studies. Now, this time it was a swift run. We were able to get a result and answer quickly so we could respond to, to journalists and explain why this has happened. And with these attribution studies, we could compare, would we see this heat 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 140 years ago, given CO2 levels now and then? Um, it's a good way to quantify the role of our climate climbing changing climate. But the conclusions were even starker than what we would have even postulated. The summer of 2018 was 30 times more likely than a world without human-induced climate change. The climate crisis had arrived in the present. It was no longer about the next generation. And that was really important during for the messaging. We were now able to talk about it and it was relevant. So attribution studies have uh, really gone through the roof over the last 18 months or so. And we can actually look at other extreme weather events and understand whether this is down to climate change in some shape or form. This is not for this talk. But the reason why I give this example is that communicating weather has to be steeped, has to be framed in science. Uh, and there is pressure to flounder. But to engage with audiences, 
the story has to be relevant it's about the now the messaging has to be clear and sometimes you don't even need words i mean the ed hawking stripes just speak to the masses and it's just a brilliant platform to communicate weather which i think in the past has been stifled and perhaps even misrepresented by very short tv or radio broadcasts and a couple of inches in the newspapers now that we've got social media the world of weather exploded onto the scene it's a perfect platform for meteorology it's visual, it's geeky, it's instant, it's impactful, and it's relevant. So hello, yes, my name is Claire Nazir. I'm a broadcaster, I'm a meteorologist, I'm a content producer, and I'm also an author of this book here. I wrote with Simon King, BBC Weatherman, after our podcast on BBC Five Live. I say Point Tech Clouds. I've covered most um, TV networks through 25 years of broadcasting. But really, I based most of what I do here at the Met Office. The Met Office for me is where I started back in the early 90s. I'm a trained meteorologist and it is the trusted expert. Through the last few years, we've developed the content team, which produces all the messaging, all the communications for weather. And we cover six social media channels covering around 1.3 million followers. And we have around 10 to 12 multi-skilled content producers. And this is not just meteorologists. These are journalists. These are designers, as well as network broadcasters and meteorologists like myself. And we cover the weather 24-7. It doesn't stop for anyone. So every day we do ask what's the story and this is how we approach it we approach it from an editorial point of view the story has to be consistent regular updates and we do cross promote depending on who we are broadcasting to so our reach goes out in lots of different ways but the most important thing is is to inform the met office is a government body we we are a service we're there to save lives uh, so when there's bad weather weather warnings have to be communicated in the clearest way we're also there to inspire and educate. Um, you know, days like today where we're producing climate papers, it's, it's a great platform to get people talking about climate change. And we're there also to promote our scientists and, and our supercomputer as well. So when we are producing content, the most important thing is to work out what the story is. And then that divides nicely into two sections. First of all, the, the topical, which is really key, is what's actually happening with the weather. But then there's the evergreen, which is a great basis, and it sort of uh, confirms what's going on in the world right now. So we produce content around those two realms, really. And so an example of this is perhaps if a hurricane is developing in the, in the tropical Atlantic. We'll be talking about forecast track, uh, impacts, updates, links to the National Hurricane Center. But alongside that, climate change is it related to climate change global drivers like el nino naming convention how uh, hurricanes are named and tropical cyclonic developments and how the names change depending on where you are um, relative to different parts of the world who our audience is is really key so what we put out on say twitter would be very different from what we would produce for say linkedin or for youtube so something like this, which is a very simple schematic, actually shows very nicely a lot of information very clearly. And it's instant information, which can be grabbed on Twitter or, say, Snapchat. However, something like the Hovmiller, and I apologize, there's a spelling mistake there. It's something for more of our higher brow or, or geeky audience, and it still has its place. So whenever we're producing any content, we have to know where is it going to be? What is going to be the maximal maximum's reach? Will people be impacted by it? Will they have a good response? And also everything has to be cleared by the scientists at the Met Office. So the process goes on day in, day out. We have two editorials a day where the scientists come down, the forecasters come down, the journalists, the designers, and we discuss what the story is. And then we, we roll out this content to various social media platforms, including broadcast as well. I know I haven't got much time left, but I'm gonna talk about uh, something else that we developed just a few years ago. And it was a step into the unknown really for us because we'd really come round to the idea that producing content should be snappy and clear and concise. And then I suggested perhaps we should be doing something which is much more of a longer format, something which creates a more of a, a layered approach to broadcasting so the 10-day trend um, 
happened, I think it was about three years ago, we started broadcasting 10 Day Trend on YouTube as well as Facebook. And we delved deeper into meteorological tools like the Hovmuller meteograms, talked more about uncertainties um, and comparing them to different computer models, and then sort of went down the rabbit hole of global drivers, which is fascinating. Um, and our approach has always been explain everything, assume no one has any knowledge, don't talk over people, but make sure that the, the information that we're imparting is clear and that we're justifying everything. So something like uncertainty needs to be explained. And the response has been absolutely incredible for the 10 day trend. In fact, it's our biggest hitter on Facebook as well as YouTube. One particular broadcast can actually pick up around 100,000 views. And that's because I think the British public have a massive appetite for weather. I could talk more and I would I will love to talk about podcasting, which I produce two podcasts a week. However, I know Dan is going to talk about that. So I'll leave that to them, him. And just want to say thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much. Claire. That was really great. And um, so does anybody have any questions for Claire? I know there's one here about is there a link to the paper that you mentioned? Yes, it's coming out um, at four o'clock this afternoon and the link will be in nature but there will also be a blog on the met office website if you go to blogs met office press office um there's a there's a piece on that and i'll be appearing on five news talking about it as well so we're going across the board there's also social media content we've produced which will go out on twitter as well as snapchat brilliant thank you very much okay so are there any more questions for claire no i have one so it's more about your uh, communicating weather warnings so and, and over the past few weeks and months, there's been an increased number of weather warnings coming out. So whether it's yellow, uh, amber, I think there might be one today. I got on a Met Office alert earlier about something to do. Uh, so is the communication of those becoming diluted because of how many that are appearing? Maybe it's due to climate change or maybe it's other reasons. I, I don't know whether it's becoming diluted, but certainly I think the yellow warning is just be aware so it's always good to have that it, as just a caveat when you're talking about the weather. It's easier to message as well when you've got a zone. Mm. And I remember the Beast from the East 2018. Um, it was probably the second red warning we'd ever, ever issued. And we very, very rarely issue those. And that's a threat to life. Don't go outside. You know, your life could be threatened by the, the weather. Mm. So I think the yellow warning is a quite a standard one just to, to highlight there will be impacts. There are impacts. And then obviously the amber, it, you know, it's heightened further and further. And we talk uh, to other Met services as well. So when we name storms, we're in partnership with the Dutch Met service as well as um, Met Aaron. And so the messaging, it just goes across the board. It's consistent. And we, we just have to make sure that the it's people understand what we're talking about. That's why naming storms is quite good because it's a familiar way of being able to bring something to the forefront and to allow people to make informed decisions basically very good thank you very much okay so ooh, well, there's loads of questions now I've just come up um okay so let's go with ben do you see a path for the met office to produce warnings on storm scales similar to the us where individual storms are given warnings might be more relevant as hail and tornado producing cells become more common yeah i mean deep convection is something we're really working on here at the met office um we have dedicated forecasters working alongside the chief forecasters every day um and the models are getting more and more on, onto a meter scale level where we can understand these really sort of tight uh, circulations which produce really violent weather so i think we are progressing down that route only in the last year we've started producing warnings for thunder and lightning and that is a step in in the right direction so i think as our weather becomes more violent and there is much scope that it will with with global heating etc then yes i think we will be going we will go down those lines we react to the weather and obviously to the the public response and it's keeping people safe is is our priority so yeah, I hope that's a, a good response. Um, I haven't spoken to the chief forecasters and working out what their plan is for the next few years, but certainly that's where we are right now. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. And I think the final one is, what do you think are the most common, Elva, what do you think are the general public's most common misunderstandings about the weather? It's hard to say, really. I mean, I, there's bugbears that we have throughout the year, like an Indian summer doesn't happen at the end of uh, August into early September. It's after a hard frost later in, in the autumn. And there are a lot of misconceptions or un, where 
the almost the 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 theory has been diluted with what happens in the press um so it is hard to say but i think the the best thing about where we're at right now with our messaging is that we can sort of realign our messaging to to sort of approach those those issues and you know add clearer consistent content sort of directed at, at any misinformation or misunderstandings we also on the met office we um we have a live uh, Facebook Live, we call it, or YouTube Live, which goes out every Tuesday before the lockdown, where we take a lot of interaction from from our viewers, and that's when a lot of these questions come up, and we can sort of debunk and demyth. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, thank you very much, Claire, for your talk and answering those questions. Um, I'll now hand over to Hannah, who's going to introduce the next speaker. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Claire, for uh, a really interesting talk. So our next speaker is Dan. Uh, so Dan, welcome. Okay. Hi there. I'm Dan Jones. I'm an oceanographer working at the British Antarctic Survey. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come along today to talk about podcasts. Um, I thought I would be specific and talk about the one that I produce and host, which is just called Climate Scientists. That uh, name is very simple, and it came from the philosophy of saying, uh, I just want to tell you what it is, just on the tin. Just let me tell you directly exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get climate scientists talking to each other. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about the motivation uh, for why I did this podcast and why I'm continuing to do it, some of the benefits that I've noticed and how it works as a, an outreach tool. Okay, so why did I start the, this podcast? Well, uh, I personally really love talking with and learning from scientists. Uh, they're some of my favorite people. I feel really privileged that I get to interact with them on a, a re regular basis in a professional context. And uh, I coupled that with I have this access to these really excellent open-hearted scientists who are willing to come and share their experiences and share their um, their kind of pathway into science. And I also have a mild addiction to long format conversational podcasts. This has uh, kind of shown up over the years. Typically, if I'm washing dishes, I'm listening to a podcast. And uh, when I used to live in Atlanta in the States, lots of traffic, lots of waiting in traffic podcast where my friend I would listen to them. And I noticed that I enjoyed them even if I didn't especially know who the guest was. I just thought there was something really nice about that format of just two or more people uh, talking about things that they're passionate about and interested in and reacting to things. And uh, I, by the Copernican principle, you know, I assumed that I'm not the center of the universe and I assumed that I'm not that weird. And there must be other people out there who would also enjoy hearing those kind of conversations between scientists, those kind of open, very loosely structured conversational uh, <clears throat> episodes. So um, let me tell you a little bit more about the format. It's only loosely structured. It's about half science content and half uh, pathways into science, which is kind of people's, you know, from where they grew up and the environment there on into their education and how they ended up where they ended up. It is long format, one to two hours. Uh, although I've recently realized that maybe I shouldn't call it long because I mean, it is, but maybe that's uh, when you're trying to, um, well, advertise a podcast for lack of a better word. Maybe long is not the adjective you want, but it is, it's honest. Uh, it, it's honestly long. It's conversational. I do very minor editing. Uh, I might take out a little bit in the beginning, not much. I sometimes even like to include the period where I'm sitting down with the person and these days where we're kind of, you know, adjusting and settling in because you can get some nice kind of human moments in those periods and you can get some some nice, uh, nice kind of moments that are good to capture in those times. It's very person focused. Here are some benefits that I've noticed. I mean, I, I did start the podcast because it was something I was personally interested in. And the feedback that I've received has been been really positive. It's been really overwhelmingly positive, And I've been so thankful for that and so appreciative of that. 
And what other people have told me is that having a podcast like that, which celebrates some members of our community and gives them a platform for sharing their passions and sharing their experiences, that that can promote and kind of help create this sense of community and kind of celebrate that sense of community. And a big advantage to me, I think, is that it makes the inner workings of academia a little less opaque, a little less mysterious. So I find that a lot of my listeners are, uh, there's a lot of students in the, in the audience. There are a lot of people who are kind of just starting their careers who are interested in hearing about, well, how has this gone for other people? What have other people's pathways, you know, looks like? So I'm really happy to have this platform to kind of put that out in the world. Like I mentioned, who's listening? Yep, yeah, we've got students at all levels, um, undergrads, grad students, uh, some kind of high school age kind of students as well. Um, members of the research community. The research community is actually pretty pretty big. I mean, there's a lot of us out there, and a lot of the audience is that research community. I've also got members of the public who want a closer look at how science actually happens, what the kind of day-to-day -day process looks like, and what that what that person's kind of if, if you want like a picture of the whole person as opposed to just their science and just the kind of um, smaller snippets and things that get presented in the, the wider media. And then I also get episode specific listeners. Um, I had a nice short conversation with Sam Illingworth, who's a professor of science communication at uh, the University of Manchester. And so I had a lot of SciComm folks specifically listen to just his that don't necessarily listen to the other ones, but they specifically uh, tune in for that. So um, I get episode-specific listeners for, you know, some guests will draw their own kind of audience in. Um, so if you're wondering, should I start a, a podcast or a science podcast? Uh, I would say if you do, and I don't really like to give advice, but I'll give a little bit of advice anyway. I'd say it's important to go with something that you personally feel like an attachment to, something that you love, because that will make it so much easier to drive that forward. It will make it so much easier to put the work in that you need to put in to make it happen. And um, in my opinion, for something like a podcast, for something like this, having a niche audience is totally fine. I think that's all right, um, because you know, that, that's the kind of media landscape these days, in my opinion, is it, it's great that we do still have stuff that reaches a broad spectrum of people. That's great. But there is also plenty of space for these kind of niche um, audience, to reach niche audiences, to find just people who might be interested in a very specific thing. Uh, I think that's okay and defensible these days. We, it's, it's so, it's relatively easy to get started. Um, you know, putting a podcast together or putting some kind of outreach activity like this together, it's relatively easy to get started. So um, we no longer have that barrier of like needing to reach as many people as possible. I don't really think there are rules. I mean, you can make these things as short or as long as you want to. You can structure it how you want to. I sort of resist any idea that there's rules for how you should be podcasting or not podcasting. I think you should just do it your way and that way it will be more unique and it will be more authentic. Um, so that, uh, that's my, my little bit of advice, I guess, is just to do it your own way and to do it how you want, then it will be your own voice and it will make it that much more, um, authentic. Okay. So I tried to keep that. I'm at eight minutes. I started a little timer over here, so I'll just wrap it up there and see if, uh, we want to talk about anything. If you have any questions, thanks again for inviting me. That was perfect. Thank you, Dan. Um, so does anybody have, have any questions? Um, so I actually have one, one myself. Um, is, if you could have anyone on your podcast, who would the one person who kind of you'd love to have on your podcast? Right now, I'd really like to talk to Catherine Hayhoe. I don't know if you've heard of her. So she is a climate scientist and a climate science communicator who um, she also identifies herself as a, a Christian evangelist. And so what she has cultivated is like an ability to talk about climate science to that specific audience. And in the States anyway, that specific audience, the evangelical audience is normally 
culturally quite dismissive of climate change and dismissive of that whole idea. Um, so by being like an authentic, by being like herself and by being able to go into those communities and say like, hey, I'm, I'm one of you, I'm, I'm not some outsider coming in, that she's been able to achieve something really extraordinary that, I mean, the rest of us would really struggle to do even if we presented the, the best facts and the best information. You know, there's some communities where like, if they don't trust us scientists, we're just not gonna get to them. Uh, so she's somebody I'd really like to talk to you right now about how she did that. <laughs> what her perspective on yeah. that has been like. That does sound like a great choice. Hopefully you'll be able to get in touch with her. So, yeah. so is there any, any questions from anyone else in the audience? Got uh, Chris from Atlanta. Thanks, Luis. <laughs> I guess another one, um, kind of when you, you're starting out a podcast, it takes a bit of time, I'm guessing, to build up an audience. Do you feel like there's people who kind of, I don't know, what kind of break it is? That kind of, kind of get, get in contact and, I don't know, do you feel like it's a bit more of a community? I've had, um, you mean like regular guests? So. Or like people, I, I don't even know if that's something you can check, but people that listen regularly and kind of interact. I know there are there are a few who do listen regularly, and um, I've got to say, like David Marshall, who's a professor at at Oxford, has been really supportive of the podcast, and um, has, been, has been really really supportive of it, and I really appreciate that. So I would count him among those people who um, they listen regularly, and and the the feedback I get on Twitter and whatnot suggests that yeah, there are some people who who listen regularly. So it's really nice to have mm -hmm. that. I have found Twitter to be really good for building that community, by the way, because if you're trying to reach like a specific audience, I think that's a good way to do it is if they're on Twitter anyway, and a lot of scientists are on Twitter. So if, if you're trying to reach uh, them and people who might be interested in scientists, then uh, yeah, Twitter's been a, a good way to go for me. Yeah, cool. Um, and then we have a question from Kathy. Uh, which podcast yourself do you admire and listen to? Sure. Do I click on, if I'm going to answer it, do I click, click uh, on? I can't seem to make that uh, question. Oh, okay. Um, so I can just, I'll just answer it. Yeah, I just, uh, go ahead. So one of the, um, one of the podcasts that I still listen to regularly, it's very different from mine in many ways but it does have that kind of long form conversational element. There's this, um, it's a pretty big one now, um, but I'm gonna make a hipster statement and say that I've been listening to it since before it was big, um, you know, since it was so small. So it's, uh, it's Pete Holmes' You Made It Weird podcast. And I think he's got a, a real talent for kind of keeping a conversation going and keeping things things flowing. Um, so I really kind of admire his ability to just sit down and, and talk with somebody and kind of be honest and present and to keep that that flow going, that conversational flow going. So I've learned a lot from from him. For science, there's a really good podcast called Ologies, O-L-O, -O, Ologies, like biology, psychology, and that's by Ali Ward. So the um, that yeah, she talks with different scientists, uh, you know, on every episode and that one is a bit more kind of science focused she does talk about the, the people's uh, the scientists lives a little bit but it's very science focused and she does this really clever thing where uh, she'll jump in and do these little um, explanations kind of in the middle of the interview which really helps with the context and uh okay i should stop there so it looks like we got a lot of other questions yeah no that's great um thank you probably time for one more and then Feel free to just answer the rest within the chat. Um, so, uh, thanks for the presentation. I have one question. Does one have to study psychology to basically have a conversation with well-known climate scientists? I don't think so. Uh, I didn't anyway. I mean, not beyond, um, I mean, I took one class as an undergrad, but that was a super general psychology sort of thing. No, I think the, the way that I, I just listened to so many podcasts that I think that was sort of how I trained my conversational style or that's what 
that's what informed it anyway. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that's, that's been a, a great um, kind of uh, keynote and set of questions. So thank you once again, you. Dan. Um, and as I said, feel free to answer some of the can questions. I just, I, oh, sorry, I can just answer them in the chat, right? No, no, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, if you could could answer them in the chat, that would be great. Or we have some time at the end for extra Q and A. Um, so next up, uh, we have Becky. Uh, so Becky, if you'd like. Hi everyone, and um, thank you very much for the invite um, today. Uh, my name is Becky Hemingway, and I work at ESMWF. And today, I'm here to talk to you about journals. So I've been asked to give a bit of an overview um, of my early career. So I went to the University of Southampton. I did a year abroad at the University of Washington in Seattle and graduated in 2012 with a master's degree in oceanography. I did a summer placement in, uh, in the, at the Met Office in the Hadley Center for three months and then was lucky enough um, to get a role in the weather impacts team um, as a weather impact scientist um, there afterwards. Um, I worked with the Natural Hazards Partnership, which is a big in, um, governmental partnership with 18 different uh, organizations. I did, um, I wrote hazard impact models. I also did a number of secondments there in innovation and application in our government service department and also in the hazard center. Also been really heavily involved with the Royal Met Society for a number of years. And those pictures there are um, myself attending the student conference um, for three years. I was part of the organizing committee in 2015 as well. So um, I've been in your shoes, um, so I hope you're having a really great conference. I decided um, after a few years at the Met Office that I just wanted to try something different. And I'd worked with the Government Services Department um, and I decided to go to Westminster. So I worked for the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, or BAES, um, starting in 2019. I did energy resilience and emergency response. I did energy policy, decided at the end um, that I missed the weather way too much um, and I really wanted to get back into it. So I was lucky enough to get a role at ESMWF this April. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the world of journals, which is a very important communication tool um, that is essential to get um, your work and information out there to the wider community. Now I'm sure you're very aware of things like Google Scholar and you spend many hours in libraries like I used to remember doing at university. Um, and I, I did a, uh, I was second author in a journal after some work experience um, at the Oceanography Centre. And I didn't realise until I actually created my own journal, uh, wrote, I don't know what's good, sorry, it's going backwards. Um, I didn't realise until I was lead author on one journal, um, actually how difficult it is. And then it became a bit of a scary world. You submit a paper, it would come back with reviews, but it would come back months and months later. Um, it needed its own formatting. It was very specific about what it required. But finally, we managed to get it through after quite a while. So much so that I did it again with a different journal requiring lots of different things. So it was all quite a confusing process. So what did I do? Well, um, I got the opportunity to be co-editor in chief of Atmospheric Science Letters, which is one of the Royal Met Society journals. I do this um, with a colleague also from East called Andrea Montani. Andrea brings a lot of experience um, of publishing. Uh, I have less experience, but I can bring things different ways. I look at things a little bit differently. So we work really well together. What Atmospheric Science Letters is, is kind of written on the, on the right hand side, a bit of a summary of what we do. But today I'm gonna to talk to you about that kind of black hole of, a, of what is the peer review? What is the process all about when you submit a paper? So it all starts um, with um, you submitting a manuscript. It is then received by the editor-in-chief, so myself or Andrea. We assign it to an associate editor. We have about 25 associate editors um, at uh, ASL. We choose the one that's most appropriate for the paper. So we read all papers. We find the most associate, associate, associate editor. And then that associate editor sends it out to reviewers. Those reviews are received. The associate editor then makes um, a decision based on those reviews, and those decisions are accept, minor revision, major revision, reject and resubmit, or reject. We approve all those decisions, and it's not to make it to do a check on our associate editors, it's just so that we get a bit of an overview of what our journal's doing. If it goes to accept, it goes straight to the publishers. In this case, while it goes through those pearly gates, we're all hoping we get our papers, papers through, and it goes into um, 
the the process there to get typeset and everything so that it can start that process to be uh, published online and in, and in paper if required. In, it's one of the other other four. Um, it goes uh, the manuscripts returned with the reviews back to the author. If it's a reject or resubmit, this generally means that the paper is something uh, that we really we like. It's got a great idea, but it just needs quite a substantial amount of work to get it to get it kind of into a state where it will be uh, publishable. So we return that and we suggest it's resubmitted once that work's been completed. Now, if we go to, re uh, to straight to reject, this is usually done because maybe things like the science has already been done. It's something that's already been done. We want something original. Um, I can, as editor in chief, I can also reject some of the pa um, papers straight away. Now, I do this generally if it's poor things like very poor English. Um, the methodology is just very um, not good enough quality, and also if it's not appropriate for our journal. So, for example, recently I got um, a paper all about biology and growing cells in petri dishes, um, very loosely related to air quality. So I rejected that and suggested they look at a more biological journal, um, not atmospheric science letters. The associate editor can also reject, reject it if they feel that it's not appropriate to send it out to reviewers. Now, taking minor revision and major revision, um, it's sent back to the authors. The authors return those revisions to the associate editor. It's then up to the associate editor to decide if that manuscript needs a second review. Now, in the case of minor revision, these are usually sent because things we've, um, there'll be things like uh, not spelling errors, a few of the images might just need a quick, a quick revamp. So it's very small things that need to be done before it can go um, up through uh, to the accept route. However, if it, so that goes straight back to decisions and then um, round to round, usually back to accept and straight to the publisher. Now, in terms of major revision, this is anything from things like small spelling mistakes all the way up to a massive substantial um, revision of the paper. So if you get major, please don't be worried about it. It can be, it's a very broad term. Now, usually when a paper comes back with major and it gets revised and sent back, uh, to, uh, to us as associate editors or editors in chief, um, we will then send it back out to the reviewers. And it's um, that's usually sometimes it's the same reviewers, they'll see it again, they'll say, yep, all those revisions have been done um, and make a, a different, potentially a different uh, recommendation for, for a decision. It can also go to new reviewers as well. And um, so it takes a bit of time to go through that process and they'll do another review. Now, usually we don't send papers round for more than three reviews. So it might come round and we send it back out again. And that's just because after the third review, we're kind of saying, well, the author's not making those changes, enough of those changes for us to keep it in our system. So we, for that, we, for example, we might suggest the reject and resubmit until they get the, all the changes put through that we recommend. Now, in terms of timescales, because thing, these things seem to take a very long time. Um, once the manuscript submitted, we receive it as editor in chief within about four to seven days. And that's just because it takes a bit of time to get into the system and to us. Then takes us a, up to a couple of days to um, assign it to an associate editor, but we do do it as fast as we can. Now, this is where you get the most time spent. Um, the associate editor has to find reviewers that are willing to review the manuscript. Now, they, they might say they might decline based on things like they just don't have time to do it. So it's not that they're not interested. They just not, might not have the capacity. Once we, the associate editor selects a reviewer, if they don't accept, they auto decline within about a week. And then they've got to look for new reviewers. Now it can take many times to find reviewers and we're looking for two per paper usually. Once a reviewer is accepted, we ask for those reviews within three weeks. However, occasionally people accept um, to redo the review. Three weeks later, they don't send anything back. We keep asking, nothing comes back. So we then have to look for more reviewers. So it does take a lot of time. Once we've got those two, two, maybe three reviews back, it takes a few days for that associate editor to make the decision. Uh, we approve that decision as soon as we can, usually within a day. Immediately, the decision is sent back, uh, returned to the author. Now, if it's a minor or major revision, the author has up to three weeks to make, that, uh, to make those changes uh, and then return it to the associate editor. And then again, a few days to decide if it needs a second review. At ASL, we aim for 120 days um, from submission to online publication. Um, that is definitely an aim and we have a very quick publication journal. That's what we aim for. Uh, we don't always achieve it, but we're really trying. Um, but you can see by these timescales, once you get around to things like second revision, you're talking of numbers of months to actually get a paper through. Now, this is all managed in a system that we have called Scholar One um, that uh, the associate editors also have access to. 
and um, we can see what's going on. We encourage two-way communication as well with our associate editors. So if there's any problems, they just let us know as soon as they can. Now, in summary, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time, but um, if you're submitting a paper, please keep the whole review process in mind, including those timescales, or ask, your, ask the journal that you're interested in about their timescales. Um, if you're doing things like a PhD, we can't publish papers in a couple of months. It just We just physically can't do it, no matter how hard we try. It's getting those reviewers that is really tough. Uh, we're all volunteers at ASL, so the editors-in-chief and all associate editors are all volunteers. We do it in our spare time. Um, some of our, our jobs do allow us to do a little bit on this, a little bit during work hours as well. If you're asked to be a reviewer, please be a reviewer. Um, your expertise is extremely valuable. Even if you haven't been in the subject that long, trust me, you do know loads. You'll know more than you think. And your opinion on whether you think this paper is good enough or what it needs um, to be better is always ridiculously appreciated. If you're interested in becoming associate editor, find a journal that you're really interested in. Get in contact with the editors in chief. If they don't have a position for you, uh, they might be able to, um, they'll probably be able to uh, let you know uh, when a position becomes available. Or an editor in chief, Royal Met Society do um, occasionally put up adverts for their journals, um, so keep an eye out for them. It is a really good role, so I'd really, and I'd really recommend it. It's dispelled a lot of myths I had. And finally, if you've got any questions about papers, there's my email address please feel free to get in contact. We can have a chat about, there's loads of other subjects I could have talked about, but I picked that one because it seemed to me a bit of a black hole when I was publishing. And with that, I said, hopefully journals are a little less scary. And thank you very much for having me. Um, so we have lots I of saw them all popping up. The <laughs> um, so where do we start? I'll go through and answer um, all of them as I can, or just email me them as well. And um, if I don't get round, if you think of any more after this. Yeah. So the first one um, from Josh is: What are the main differences between working at the Met Office and ECMWF? So ECMWF is a lot smaller. Um, I've also never actually been into ECMWF at the moment. I started my job remotely at home. <laughs> So it's slightly different. Um, I'm doing a, a quite a different role at the Met Office. I was primarily a scientist. Um, now I do user engagement and outreach. So I'm think, doing things like running conferences, hosting meetings and, and things like that. Everyone's lovely in both of them. Um, obviously, the, the models, they do have, they specialize in different things. So Eastern WF specializes in the slightly longer range than the Met Office does. And um, the Met Office has the um, the way you know to the remit to do all the the weather warnings and uh, there's a lot of the more broadcast stuff as well so they both focus on the weather which is why they're both great and the met office was fantastic when i worked there um eastern wf is really great um i've only been there a few months um i can't really think of many differences apart from every everyone's just lovely and um it's really hard to pinpoint what those differences are just at the moment um the scientists are all so intelligent and so brilliant um everyone's super helpful and um, they always were the Met Office I suppose the biggest difference is just the size of them and the remit as well Met Office has a UK focused remit they do do quite a lot of work internationally as well but Eastern WF has that it's European Commission not European Union so it's got that European Commission remit and they do a lot of Copernicus work which is EU so they're looking at kind of Europe a little bit more focused as well. Oh, thank you Becky. Um... So, um, too many to choose from. I think that one has kind of, so there's one about the whole review process. Um, I think that's been answered fairly well by your talk anyway, so I'll go on to the next one, seeing as we have, have quite a few. Um, so Sophia has asked, how did you become an editor? Were you a reviewer for a long time beforehand? So actually, I'd only reviewed about two papers before I came, became an editor. And it was um, an advert on the Royal um, Meteorological Society website um, for ASL. And uh, Liz Bentley got in contact with me as well, just because I'm quite an active member of Royal Met, so of Royal Met so um, and said, is this something that you'd be interested in doing? So um, I think it's just look for those adverts. If you're an active member, people will think, oh, actually, it's something that they might might be good at and, and approach you to do a role like that. Um, and as I said, it has taught me loads. It's taught me lo loads about how the whole process works and um, how be being a reviewer and being a publishing and being an editor, it gives you a very different perspective on everything. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that answers your question. Wow. If you've got any more, please put them in the chat or email me. 
Yes, so we probably have time for one more and then we can go on to the kind of panel discussion um, section. I'm going to go with this one from Ben, um, just because it's the next one in the chat. So this is a tricky question, so feel free to pass. Do you think the financial model of journals needs to be changed to avoid exhortation? Um, there's been a lot of negativity surrounding this topic in academia for many years. Oh, I'm not too well versed on this one. Um, I know the fact, um, so we're an open access journal at ASL, so the um, the publisher, the author pays to publish. Um, there are some um, things in place, so I know if you're a, in a UK university, you can publish in, with us for free. It doesn't come out of any of your budgets, it comes out of a bigger like UK budget um, for publishing. Um, I think it is quite hard. Journals need to keep their finances going. They need to be able to publish. There's an awful lot of work that goes into publishing. And again, as an editor, you, you see all this work. Um, the publishers at Wiley, um, we've got quite a few people that help with Raw Metsot journals that help us do the publishing. All the typesetting takes quite a long time. Um, and then there's all the websites and the actual print publications for some of them as well. So I think it, things need to, need to change, but open access seems to be the way to go, which is what we are already. And I know quite a few papers are going into that as well. Um, I think it's always going to be one of those topics that there's never going to be an answer that solves it for everybody. Um, but I think a few initiatives are getting there to make it a lot easier for everybody to publish, including those from developing countries. There are um, grants in place for them. There's grants in place for, for universities and other certain countries as well. So there are some steps that are being made to, to help those finances. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. Thanks, thanks Becky. Um, so I think now if we move on to the panel discussion, um, so I'll turn off my webcam and then Claire and Dan, if you wanted to turn your webcams back on um, so that we have the three panellists. And then if anyone has any, any kind of questions that you'd like the panellists to discuss, pop those into the chat. I've got one myself in that you've all three described very different ways of communicating science. So we've got communicating to the public, we've got podcasts and we've got papers. And it's great, they're the illiterate as well. Um, but if you're trying to find out a way to get like the most out of your communication, what do you think is the best way to go for? So do you think there's like a, an equal ground you can get to communicate to everybody? Or do you think it's all more about focusing down on certain audiences? I think that's a tricky one, to be honest, because I think each social media platform is different. It, like every publication, it, it attracts a different type of audience. Um, so that's why a broad reach sort of captures most people, but you're always going to miss out on a certain part of your audience. Mm -hmm. That's why I love podcasting, to be honest. I think it's so accessible and it's such a conversation. It's raw around the edges and you can produce something very quickly. So when we are issuing weather warnings at the Met Office, we can turn something round quicker than perhaps the designers can. We like Twitter, it's very instant. So I think instant when it comes to present weather, but when you're doing something which is more evergreen, then um, I think picking your audience is, is really important. I don't think you can please all the people all the time. Yes, I, I will happily defend going after a niche audience and just like finding the specific set of people who are interested in the specific thing that you're making. I think that's actually an exciting kind of opportunity that we have right now is, you know, in you know, a couple of decades ago, there were just two or three big broadcasters, right? And you really did have to try to cast as wide a net as possible, but it's actually fine to just these days we have the opportunity and the um, kind of platforms that, we can use to just reach smaller audiences. I think from a journal point of view, obviously publishing your your paper or your work has probably a lot more longevity than something like Twitter or potentially even a, a podcast mm -hmm. you can go back to and find, but it's the longevity of the work. It'll, you find papers and you, you reference them all the time from the 50s, the 60s, um, and it's uh, easy to find in tools like uh, Google Scholar. Um, but it's also you need to have the promo almost the promotion of papers and journals when you do publish them through things like Twitter and Facebook 
and I know Raw Metsock do do quite a lot of promotions and tweets and advertising and marketing around all their journals and articles that they think are, are kind of really helpful as well. So I think it's getting that balance right. You, you need a really good methodology be, to be able to be published, but then you need to complement it with a podcast about it and a blog about it, uh, some tweets about it as well. So it's kind of getting everything at the right balance to make sure you get the most readership hmm. you can. Okay, so we're going to go to some questions in the chat now. I can see they've appeared. So the first one is from Paloma. It says, really enjoyed your talks. Thanks. How did you find out what or what your audience wants to learn about you? About, sorry. Um, well, from my point of view, I think it's, it's experimenting. And um, there's some great books out there where you can learn that if you, it's trial and error, really. And interestingly, we have on our YouTube channel, The Met Office, some of our um, biggest hitters are quite unusual. The historical um, stories about how Fahrenheit developed or, you know, Alexander Buchan, it's really fascinating how people can latch onto that and find it really engaging. So again, we it's experimental. And I think the social media platform is like that at the moment. Our podcasts are very similar. There's some which really capture the imagination of people. We interviewed a pilot a few months ago to talk about what does the weather look like at 40,000 feet. And it was just so fascinating and really resonated with our audience. Whereas some I think are really interesting, perhaps don't get so much of an audience. So yeah, it is, it's trial and error. Um, but you again, you know, that doesn't mean to say that the more niche as Dan would would put it the more niche subjects don't have a place because they do oh that's that's good yeah it's um um oh gosh i started talking and then i forgot what i was going to say um do you want do you want to go yeah, did you have anything just, just a couple um, of comments i suppose from a journal perspective yeah. um i suppose that the the authors publish in the journal, we kind of don't go to, we do go to some authors and say, we'd like a, a, a paper on this and you'll find invited papers or special editions do do this. Um, but usually it's very much about what the audience wants to tell the rest of the world. Um, so we do do surveys and find out how the journals are performing. Um, but generally um, we don't go really, we kind of more of a conduit to get your research out and um, more than actually saying, this is what you should be talking about. Cause we, we don't want to do that at all. We want to let see what we do see trends as well. So we've had a, a climate. We had a trend for climate change for quite a while. Then we've had a trend recently for a lot more Asian papers about the monsoon. So we do see trends going through and we do try and pick out uh, those papers that people might be more interested in and do a little bit more marketing around those. Thank you. I remembered now. So it's also iterative for me. You know, I trial and error. Uh, I to some extent follow the stuff that I'm interested in. And then I see, uh, again, using that Copernican principle and assuming I'm not that weird, that uh, I assume there will be other people who are also interested in those topics. Like, uh, for example, there was a conversation with Ethan Campbell that I did a couple months ago about these enormous holes that open up in the sea ice, these polinias. And there's a whole fascinating science story there about how um, they were observed at the end of the, the beginning of the satellite era and then they went away for a few decades and then in 2016 they started coming back and uh, so like that's a really fun science story it, it's like it's iterative trial and error i've i've only had one guest who was more like policy focused and i found that there wasn't a big response to that one so i think i don't have a huge policy audience um which is fine and uh, so yeah it's just this process of um, learning who your audience is, I guess, and what sort of things they really are interested in. Okay, so next question from Erin. As communicators, how effective do you feel is the change in tone of media outlets such as The Guardian, who now use the language of climate emergency and global heating, rather than the more familiar words such as climate change and global warming, and should we use this when communicating to the public? I'm happy to yeah, just perfect. comment on that. Um, I, I do think the language of climate change is evolving. It's evolving as the next generation come into the forefront and create their own language, which is far more powerful than, say, my generation, uh, you know, sort of 20, 30 years ago. And it's important that the language does change. 
and it's important because it as i said in my talk it's about the present now rather than future generations and it's imminent and people there's a high level of anxiety associated with it however alongside that then uh, there are other aspects to climate change which are as important such as climate solutions and green tech and green finance etc so it's it's now become its own microcosm and um, you, you, we could talk about this for hours but from my point of view the more varied the, the language is the better really because I think a it reaches a, a much broader audience and it describes it's a it's a huge subject it's a it's and it's very emotive as well as everything else the climate science is there but even so it's just trying to engage on on every level from governments to businesses to, to general public so the more words that we can describe this huge issue the better that's a great answer i don't have a lot to add but i'll just say i don't see any particular issue with using the term climate emergency and global heating it is an emergency it's a slowly unfolding emergency and i think it's fine to to call it that i do i can imagine you know there will be some people like in the southeast us where i grow up who will say like oh now we're calling it something else now we're calling it something different and um but some of those folks will dismiss climate change no matter how we package it uh, so there are some folks who will be very very difficult to reach regardless of what you how you say it and uh, i think there's a value in calling it what it is and it is an emergency even if even if using that phrase doesn't get everyone on board it's it's okay to label it with what you think it is i think for journals yeah. um these words do filter through eventually but it's probably a larger lag than in the media um you'll see um, the more mm. kind of traditional phrasing being used most of the time i haven't seen climate emergency in a paper yet but i can imagine it coming through now from my policy days like last year and earlier this year um actually the climate emergency came in really fast into i think the protests right outside our building in one victoria street helped um people would come in with the um with the leaf with the leaflets and it had climate emergency um from extinction rebellion all over it and every, it then started that conversation going and those that phrasing was sl slowly starting to get into some of the documents that i did see um so i think it, if it can affect help policy makers and decision makers and um, to understand the problem and escalate you know how quick it needs to be escalated up i'm kind of all for all for all for trying to it, it brings it back to the forefront which i think is what needs to be done so i'll go to the next question um from lindsay do you think organizations like the bbc met office Armet, should play more of a role in calling out newspapers outlets for their over the top slash misleading headlines Oh, I know Liam Dutton has done some Twitter, but should more be done? I think it's quite hard um, based on, um, so the BBC and the Met Office are both UK government. Uh, the BBC does get a lot of government money. Uh, so I think it's really hard. You've got to really think about the organisation and what they're, um, we had to be really careful when I worked for Bayes, what we said, and what we, we could do. Um, and the same any organization you work for they've got what they can and can't say so I, I don't think it's probably i think the newspapers are slightly a they do what they want and it's quite hard to call them out from an official organization individually if you want to do it on twitter as long as you've put you know all views of my own i you know feel free um, but you've got to also look at your organizational um what they say you can and can't do on social media even on your personal social media um, you've got to be, you know, really think about anything before you start calling things out. I've got something. Would you, would you like to go ahead? Or? I um, I agree. I think it's. I think the, the newspapers are a law unto themselves, and you know, you can really bang your head against the wall when you see some of these headlines, and you can brief these journalists, and they will write whatever they want, and and that it's it's so frustrating, um, and it's wrong as well. Uh, because you're scared a lot of the time it's scaremongering but they will write what they want so I think the most important thing is is to be consistent and and have continuity in producing from our point of view uh, messaging which goes out regularly and and out to as I said the, a broad audience so yes we do have to um, brief journalists all the time and there are certain ones who we just almost the blood drains from your face when you see them 
but you still have to give them the top line whether they take that or not is is another matter i think liam dutton does a very good job of that sometimes i think he goes a little bit too far but even so um somebody's got to to play them at their own game i'm a big fan of this service called climate feedback which has now gotten more general uh, it's called uh, science feedback I'll try to put a link in the chat box in a second there. So they will take a news item and they will seek expert reviews from scientists of that news item. And they will get the scientists to go through their articles in detail, give them an overall ranking of is this accurate or misleading, to label it with specific keywords like misleading or I forget some of the other keywords. And the, the author, these scientists can go through line by line and highlight specific lines and say, oh, well, this isn't, this is overstated or this isn't correct. Um, I've done a couple of those reviews and uh, I'm a big fan of that idea uh, because that does offer this kind of scientific community, maybe not something like the BBC or the Metsoc uh, for, for the reasons that have been outlined already, but it does at least offer the scientific community another chance to say, hang on, hang on. No, you didn't, you didn't quite get that right. Um, and uh, so that, that work, I think, is really important. It does take some time between when the article is published and when the scientists get their reviews in. So it has that disadvantage of in the, the, in the super kind of fast-paced media world that we operate in, sometimes a delay of a few days means that that story has been completely forgotten. Um, but it's still a valuable service, and I, I'm really a fan of, of that effort i'll look for the link in a second I think here. just to add as well Thank about yeah. um i think claire mentioned it as well just about educating people like giving the facts and then educating people to say you know don't take everything the newspapers say as truth go and find your own evidence go and find that information um before you start believing everything they say so i think education is massive and it's maybe something you know these organizations like this do all the time they educate people with facts um and it's up to people to go and find those facts before start starting to believe uh, newspapers and headlines. Uh, we've got a question here from Viola. Um, in line with what Dan Jones said about reaching people who might never agree slash accept climate change as a problem, how do you recommend reaching out to these people? I think the subject of climate denial, I've got a really good, good book here, actually. I think you have to be forearmed. This book is by someone called Richard Black is part of the energy um, climate information security information so I can't remember what the, the acronym is but you get my gist. he's brilliant and he calls them contrarians and I think his uh, line of argument is so strong I think when you're dealing with people like that it's good to really be as I say for arm with some really strong counter arguments but some people are never ever going to be satisfied by that and there's always going to be a percentage who will deny I think that percentage has gone down. I really do think it has. And certainly there's been step change, particularly in, in, um, in government as well as um, in media over the last few years. I'll give you an example. Um, it was really hard to report climate change 20 years ago. When I worked at GMTV as a producer presenter, I remember the 2001 third assessment um, IPCC report coming out. And I went to my editor with a story and said, uh, come on, you know, the, the, the coastline of Britain is going to be redrawn, you, you know, with climate change, sea level rise, East Anglia, we're going to lose East Anglia. And he said, what's the time frame? I said, 100 years. He said, we'll make it 25 years and you've got yourself a story. And so I think there has been certain step changes and climate scientists has really been able to solidify the science so that people find it harder and harder to deny. And there will always be elements out there where you, you're never ever going to get to those people, you're never going to reach those people. Although, as Dan said, there are people who are evangel the evangelist person you talked about Dan who absolutely mm -hmm. yep. has the language and everything is absolutely framed right for that set of people so maybe that's the way forward yes I, I think for some people climate denial is like part of their identity you know they feel like they're a part of a certain group and they have noticed that well this group is, is a climate denial type group uh, and we don't believe in climate change as a unit. And so they will sign up to that set of beliefs uh, and, and they will reject anything related to climate and climate change just because that's part of their personal and political identity. And I guess, you know, the only way to potentially reach those people is to 
be in that community or to directly kind of feel like you're relatable. I, I don't think there's a general way to do that. I think you just like, we need, we need people in these communities who can reach them individually. I think it's, it's very hard. Like I think the tailoring, the advice, tailoring the way that you approach the people is definitely to me would be the way to go as, um, as I know you're, you're doing down and making it relatable to them. However, I, I do remember a story of um, someone having to get flooded four times before they actually accepted that it was a problem. Um, so it, sometimes people have to experience the problem themselves. Saying that climate change is a, is a problem um, to the wider world, to them they might not care. It's when it affects them and you can pr it affects them multiple times, they then start to take notice of why is it, start asking why is this happening? And then again, looking at education and looking at the evidence, then it's up to them to make their own decisions. I don't think you'll ever be able to find a world where no one denies climate change. There are people that still think the world's flat and we have evidence galore showing it's not. Um, so it, it, it's that kind of level. Last. Um, I try quite hard to keep things as accessible as possible but I worry that I sometimes lose people who could latch on to more information. How do you find the balance between enough science and facts without being information overload? I think this idea of um, this that we've already kind of mentioned about um, kind of doing the outreach in many different forms. You know, you have the scientific article, maybe you have the blog post, maybe you have the podcast. And that way the people can kind of select what level they're interested in. Um, it kind of reminds me of, there's this, uh, this blog called Real Climate and they have these three tabs on every kind of climate issue. They have basic, intermediate and advanced so that somebody can go to that blog, look up a climate issue, and then select the level of detail that they want, um, which as you're alluding to in, in your question, Rachel, like that's really hard to predict what level, you know, any given person uh, listening or reading your content, what do they want? So it's, if there is a way to give them a selection, that could be, that could work well. It seems to work well for the real climate blog anyway. I've seen the same I think thing long BBC, format. Oh, sorry, I was just going to comment that I've seen the same thing on BBC News as well. They do kind of story in a hundred word story and mm. a five hundred story and a thousand, depending on the level of detail. And I think yeah. it's a really good way to get for you to pick how much information you'd like. I think some people are just natural communicators as well, and they are able to just mix that that whole storytelling, in, you know, interspersed with incredible facts. I listened to a brilliant podcast the other day called "You've Been Warmed," and it was the the president of Norrie. It's all about um, carbon trading, particularly for soil regeneration. And this guy was absolutely amazing. And the way he described blockchain was just out of this world because it's a really hard concept, and he didn't dumb it down, but at the same time, he didn't intellectualize. And I think there is a fine line between science and fact. And it's when it joins together. And it, I think communicating science is not only a skill, it's something that comes with practice and doing it over and over again and listening to other people as well and how they frame something. So um, it's, you know, it's for me, it's a, um, a work in progress, which I've been trying to refine for the last 25 years. And there are much better people out there. So, yes, it's always good to listen and learn. for one or two more questions um so one here the scientist is the main person who can communicate the climate change correctly to the public who observes the public has different approaches theories about climate we observe that the public has different approaches slash theories about climate change do you believe something goes wrong with scientist communication with audiences in this hot topic I think science. Sorry, I think scientists. Uh, um, we have the, the sort of the section of scientists, and we have those who are journalists. Um, and some scientists find it very hard to communicate their their theory, what they're what they're writing about. And others are brilliant at it. Not ev not everybody can't be good at everything. And I think you do find your place within the science community. 
And when we um, interview people for our podcast for the Met Office, when there's a, uh, a, a report just to be just about to be published, you talk to the scientists first of all, and then you know whether they are they will be okay in a longer format interview or something which is much more of a soundbite where you're almost feeding them questions and they can give the headlines in such a way where it's mostly accessible. So everybody communicates in so different ways, but I think when, when it comes to climate science, it's important that the, the clarity is there, the narrative is really fresh and clear, and I think it's up to the editor to actually bring the best out of those climate scientists. I think there are specialists that sit between the two, so the climate, the science and the communication. Um, and the scientists don't, I think as Claire said, they don't always enjoy the communication side. They'd rather just say, this is my work, like in a journal, um, and just present their work. And then pushing them any further, they're, they're just not comfortable with it. So you, you get you know, people like the Met Office team that can sit as that conduit between the two. And um, you just need to find out who, who they are and who's most comfortable. It's, it's always good to have as well um, someone that's always speaking about climate change on a comes up over and over again because they get notoriety they get more and more more followings um there's many climate scientists that that do this that are great at communicating but there's others that just prefer to sit in the background and do do the work and then they'll communicate in their own way as well hmm. i was kind of reading that the last sentence there about do you believe that something goes wrong with that communication i guess a lot of things go wrong um and there's you know several there's so many people involved right there's the scientists and then there's the journalist and then there's the individuals consuming it and there's so many opportunities for misunderstanding and for there's not necessarily a good it's not like a full conversation where you can go back and forth and iterate on it and make sure that everybody's on the same page it's often much more of a one one dimensional thing which makes me wonder if um maybe having more kind of full cycle kind of looped conversations would be helpful um but yeah there's there's a lot of things that go wrong and that that's a huge topic i think you could write books about that reason one last question um before the end of the session um so joshua has asked do you think there is a technological barrier for someone thinking about getting started in podcasting and communications, e.g. needing the right microphones or editing slash graphic design skills. And do you have any recommendations for what skills slash equipment people should invest in when starting out? That sounds like a damn question. I can recommend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can recommend, I can tell you about my setup. Um, so, when I decided that I wanted to, to do this podcasting thing, my wife as a Christmas present got me these microphones. You can use, you don't have to have these. You can have so many different kinds of microphones uh, and you can, you can actually get by okay just using your like headphone microphone or your laptop microphone. It's okay, you, you'll be, it'll be fine. Um, but this is like the, one of these blue microphones. That's the, here you go. That's it. I'm sure I'm making a ton of noise now, moving my microphone around, but uh, with the little pop shield on here. So that was my, my wife's Christmas present to me to, as a way to say, like, go ahead, just do it. Just give it a try, uh, which was very sweet. Um, so the service that I use, uh, sorry, I'll back up one step. I do use GarageBand to edit the podcasts, and that is on my, my kind of work MacBook here. Um, but there's different free alternatives for that if you wanted to have something where you mix the different parts together. But the 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 luckily these days getting started is really easy um, and I don't get any money from these folks this is not a promotion but the service I use is called anchor and anchor is a website and an app and they have kind of in-app tools for recording and editing uh, your own episodes and then when you upload an episode it's pushed out to 11 different podcast sites like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, Google Podcasts, and uh, a bunch of others that I'd never heard of before until I, you know, started trying this. So yeah, Anchor is a really good way to get started. That's been my experience anyway. Um, if you go into various uh, podcasting threads on the internet, people can give you different experiences about different services. There are, there are alternatives, but Anchor is the one that I can recommend for getting started. Um, I use Audacity and also um, mm -hmm. and a very simple way of starting podcasting is on Zoom as well. Again, I'm not sponsored by either of those, 
we're just pressing record on zoom you sometimes get a bit of a lip sync mm -hmm. problem i've got a big mic as well which i use for my as a yeti and they're quite quite handy um i think if you've got a good conversation recording it in any shape or form that's the way to start it's getting the content out there um and it's a brilliant way it's a brilliant i love it i absolutely and for someone who's worked on tv for 25 years for me my passion is podcasting i think it's just a brilliant medium uh, to get really sort of dig deep into into a subject yes and if i could just jump in um one of the nice things that zoom gives you is transcripts and i've recently had this pointed out to me that like um you know if you offer a podcast without transcripts then that cuts off the deaf community and hard of hearing community from being able to access it so for accessibility it's much uh much better to like have a transcript version of your podcast also which is something you do get automatically in zoom they're not always perfect but they're usually all right i've never done a podcast so i can't come on here <laughs> <laughs> brings the end uh our session on podcasts and science communication so thank you all very much uh speakers for coming here and doing your talk they're all really fascinating and really great q a we had going uh, one thing we wanted to mention is one of our own committee members, Paloma, has done their own podcast, The Climate Press. And this is all about, they've done a special episode for us on how to make a podcast, which is really quite um, fitting, really. So I'll put the link on there if you want to check it out. And um, I think there's a link on our website as well, uh, the student conference website. Mm. So yes, thank you very much for attending. And I'm going to hand over to Liz Bentley, who's the CEO, who's going to close the session for us and close the conference. So thank you very much for attending and I hope you had a really nice keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. That was great. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so yes, I've been asked to close the, the conference uh, with some closing remarks and also to uh, announce the prize winners. We've got a number of prizes from the conference uh, and I'll run through those as well. Um, I don't know if Susie, could you um, put up the slideshow uh, to start with? We'll stay on that first slide for now. But yeah, just a, a really big thank you to everybody who's helped pull this conference together. Uh, it's been a fantastic two days, an excellent event uh, with over 100 people participating uh, across the two days. The society has never done anything on this size and scale before. Um, it's been a real opportunity for us, but a huge learning curve as well as we've um, uh, trialed different platforms uh, and eventually chose Demio, the system that we've used over the last couple of days. So I've got a huge thank you to say to, to a number of people. And the first really is to thank the Royal Met Society staff um, if I can ask Sam and Susie just to put your cameras on, just so that people can say hello, maybe put a face to a name. Um, you've probably seen Sam and Susie or heard them on chat over the last couple of days. Hello, Hi, everyone. Susie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Big thank you to Sam and Susie. They have been involved in pulling the student conference together for, for not just the last couple of days, but for weeks uh, in, in making sure we had the right system. We've done all the testing and briefing, uh, you know, both the speakers and the chairs and so forth. So really huge thank you to you two. Um, there's also a few other people. Um, so I'm going to shut my camera off so we can have these three people on. So again, uh, Sam and Susie, I don't know if you want to switch off now. So Afe. If you can put your cameras on again members of our met staff who've been really actively involved behind the scenes you've probably not seen these people over the last few days uh, maybe not even heard of them but they've been um pulling together supporting really the work we've done making sure the technology works behind the scenes dealing with uh, any technical issues and, and supporting the speakers and, and the chair so big thank you to you three as well so a team of us really working very hard to make this conference a great success uh, Susie, if you can move on to the next slide. So also a review to our organising committee, and I've talked about this on a, a couple of sessions during the, the last couple of days. Uh, so we have an organising committee made up of, well, you guys, uh, students and early career scientists. Uh, we've got our two co-chairs on the right hand side here, Hannah and Joe. And then on the left hand side, there's the rest of the committee and some members of staff. And this was what, our second committee meeting that took place at Leeds University in March this year. 
And it was uh, at a time when we were looking at the abstracts that had been submitted for poster and oral sessions, and we were shaping the program for the conference. And a question arose as we were at that meeting, because the pandemic was starting to take hold and starting to kind of transfer around the world. Um, the question was raised, well, what happens if we can't do a face-to-face -face conference? Are we going to try and do a virtual conference? And well, the rest, I suppose, they say is history. We, we worked as a team to really look at how we might make this event happen. And well, you can see it has happened. It's been a fantastic success. We've kept a very similar structure to what we would have done in a face-to-face -face with oral sessions, poster sessions, keynote sessions, as you've seen over the last couple of days. So a huge thank you to the guys on the committee. Uh, I'll, I'll read their names out. I've mentioned Joe and Hannah as co-chairs. We've got Chris, we've got Jinwa, we've got Sean, Paloma, Amethyst, Tom, Ben and Joshua. So a huge thank you to you all. And we'll be sending you a little gift through the post in the next few days. So look out for that. Um, We'll be thinking about next year's conference as soon as we start to wrap this one up. And I mentioned, I think, on the quiz yesterday, we're looking for new member committees. I'm hoping some of the guys who are on this year's committee will stay on as committee members next year. But if you're interested in joining the committee for next year's conference, please do email the society. And I think maybe Hannah or someone, if you can just put up in the chat the email address, uh, which is conferences at rmets.org. Uh, we also look for student ambassadors, so if you're interested in getting involved in helping out as a student ambassador, again, uh, a good email to, to send that to. Um, one of the first things the new committee will do is to review the survey from this conference. So in the next couple of days, we'll be sending you out a survey with a few questions about how the event's gone, what you liked, what didn't work, what you'd like to see different next year. So please do spend a few minutes just filling that survey in, particularly with being a virtual event. We really want to learn, you know, what worked well and is this the kind of thing we should be doing in future? So uh, when you see the email coming through with the survey, just spend a few minutes filling that in. And it's already been mentioned, but there's lots of resources around this event still online. Uh, we talked about the podcast that Paloma and the team at Leeds University have pulled together, but other resources available. So I'd encourage you to go back to the Royal Met Society website and this event page to, to gather the resources around this particular conference. Right, so the first now the first announcement of our first prize, this is the photo competition that we ran during uh, the break yesterday and then the break today. So we had a number of images that were sent in from uh, you as delegates and uh, you've been voting during those two um, uh, breaks. And so I can announce, so Susie, Jerome Roll, if you want to move on to the next slide, that the winner was, uh, oh, if you go back one slide, uh, this was the winning image. So this was a photograph taken in Interlaken by Beatrix Fernandez Duque, and this was entry number 26. Uh, it was quite a close vote, I think, in the end, but this was the winning one. So uh, fantastic image. Uh, congratulations to Beatrix, and we'll be sending a, a gift through the post as a prize uh, for winning our photo competition. Right, uh, moving on, a little plug here. So uh, and I realise um, I mentioned this a couple of times. We have the Weather Photographer of the Year competition. Uh, the Society runs this annually and we're in our fifth year. Um, and the uh, competition closes next Monday, the 6th of July. If you've got any stunning images, so even the ones that we've just seen in our photo comp for this conference, if you want to submit your own image or any of those images to the uh, photo uh, photographer of the year competition, then the uh, website link is shown on this slide. And again, maybe Hannah or someone will just put that in the chat so people can uh, link on to that. That would be great. A uh, little plug also for membership of the Royal Met Society. Uh, if you aren't already a member, I would encourage you to join. Uh, as a student, you get a heavily discounted membership fee, so it's currently £43 a year, and you're likely to get that covered by uh, your organisation or department or research programme. Uh, you also keep that discount uh, once you've graduated for three years. We have an early career discount. So while you're moving into a career, you still get that, that um, student discount for those three years. Uh, when you remember, you get access to things like funding. So we uh, give out travel grants and research grants. Uh, again, some of you will have probably uh, benefited from that already if you're members. You also get discounts to events, uh, to books and our journals. Uh, we'll keep you informed in what's happening across the science of meteorology, but also the community, different people working in different professions. 
And even though it's very difficult at the moment to do networking, we do an awful lot of activities that help you to network with other people across the community, although in a virtual sense at the moment. Uh, we also have lots of careers advice, so information of the different types of jobs that you may be interested in, and we, we run a jobs board for, uh, to, um, for appointments that are vacancies that are available, so have a look at that as well. Um, and we also have prof professional development activities and CPD activities that you may be interested. And I guess even joining this organising committee for this conference is, uh, can be something that's useful for your own professional development. So if you're interested in any of that, anything to do with membership, then the email is membership at Um I'd like to say thank you to Tom and his mum for putting that quiz together that we ran yesterday afternoon. It was fantastic, uh, great fun uh, social event around the conference. So thanks to Tom. Um, but I would like to point you to another weather quiz, uh, something that we're running with Wiley at the moment. Uh, and Hannah is going to put up some details in the uh, in the chat about our weather quiz. Um, it's currently in the July issue of weather. Uh, and uh, the deadline is the 17th of July. Uh, there are eight questions in total, um, and they basically are reflecting different content that appear in our uh, weather journal. Uh, the prize is a, a Royal Met Society membership, free membership to our society, uh, and also you receive, uh, receive copies of weather as well. Um, to enter the prize door, all you have to do is complete the quiz. So Hannah has put up a link in the chat for the weather quiz. So if you enjoyed Tom's quiz yesterday, or even if you just want to enter this quiz, I'd, I'd click on the link and do that. Great. OK, so we have a number of prizes that we um, can present to some of the poster and oral sessions. And uh, there are 12 prizes in, in total. So I'm going to run through these. They're in groups, uh, three different groups. The first one. So again, Susie, I don't know if you want to move on to the next slide. We have prizes um, for some places at the Young Voice of Young Scientists workshop. So this is something that's run by Sense About Science, and they put on different workshops around the UK um, to help uh, scientists, uh, early career scientists, students, to help communicate your science. So you'll learn how to communicate your science better, how to engage with the media. If you go back the slide, because you're giving it all away. Thank you. So we have five uh, places that we can offer. Um, three from all presentations. So uh, congratulations to Sarah Greenham. Can we go back again? Sarah Greenham is at University of Birmingham. Uh, Sarah presented in session six uh, on uh, climate change and extreme heat related impacts on the London underground infrastructure. Uh, the second oral prize goes to Viola Heinrich. And that was also in session six, and that was on using remote sensing to access the climate mitigation potential of secondary forests in the Brazilian Amazon. And the third oral prize in this group goes to Michael uh, Badu, and that was in session seven today, uh, the dynamics and meteorological applications session. Uh, and the presentation was on climatology and structure of mesoscale convective systems in southern West Africa. We also have two prizes from the poster sessions. Uh, the first of those goes to Isabel Smith from the University of Reading, uh, and she presented her poster in poster session C today. Uh, and the title of her poster was Meteorological Influences on Lightning Strength in a Changing Climate. And the second poster prize in this group goes to Erin Walker, who is at the University of Bristol. So this was a pre-recorded poster session from yesterday, uh, and Erin's uh, poster was on the role of increasing vertical resolution on the detection and attribution of North Atlantic storms. So congratulations to those five. Um, we'll be contacting you. Uh, we have a certificate, uh, but also information about how you can uh, register for one of the Voice of Young Scientists workshops. Congratulations. Uh, next slide, we have two prizes um, from uh, these, it's something that's sponsored by Wiley, our scientific publishers. So these are vouchers of £100 uh, for two, um, I think they were poster prizes. Uh, so the first one goes to Daniel Hoare, who um, uh, uh, gave a, a poster presentation on inferring London's methane emissions from atmospheric measurements. And that was in session four, poster session B. 
Uh, and from the same poster session, um, also Chris Boykin, who's at the University of Reading, whose poster was on extracting likely scenarios from high resolution forecasts in real time. So congratulations to both of you. Again, you'll be receiving a certificate and vouchers from Wiley. Uh, so enjoy those. And the final group uh, are all for oral presentations. Um, each of these will be encouraged to submit uh, an article to a special issue of Weather, and they'll get support from the, the co-editors of Weather uh, to help uh, publish their, their, their science. So I'll run through these. We've got Alex Doyle from the University of Reading, who presented in session one yesterday, uh, and his presentation was on uh, 2016 Indian monsoon cloud development observed using Doppler weather radar. We've got Akshay Diros, who uh, presented in session seven. Oop, if you can go back. Uh, and uh, Akshay's presentation was on comparison of the prediction of Indian monsoon low pressure systems uh, by sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction models. The next one is uh, Rachel Sansom, uh, University of Leeds. And this was presented in session two yesterday on air quality and modeling. Uh, and the presentation was on statistical methods to quantify the, and visualize the complex behavior of clouds in the climate system. The fourth prize in this section is to Timothy Banyard uh, from the University of Bath, presented um, in session seven uh, on dynamics and meteorological applications. And the presentation was called, Can We Wave Goodbye to Parameterizations? And the final prize to present uh, is to Elizabeth Siddle from the University of East Anglia. Again, in session one, this was the observation sessions that opened our conference yesterday morning. And the title of the presentation was Investigating Air-Sea Interaction in the Tropical North Atlantic Using Novel Combination of Autonomous Vehicles. So congratulations to all 12 of those uh, prize winners and also the photography competition prize winner as well. Uh, we'll be contacting you uh, directly with, with further information. So it really just leaves me to say a really big thank you again to all the organisers, the chairs, the speakers and all of you as delegates. Um, as I say, we've had over 100 people, more than 100 people engage with the conference over the last two days. And it's been fantastic for us to be able to run this virtual conference. And all I uh, left to say really is I hope to see some of you next year. Hopefully we will be able to run a face to face conference next year. Uh, and hopefully we'll see some of you either on the committee or at next year's conference. So I'll close the conference there and say goodbye from myself and the rest of my colleagues at the Royal Met Society.